Okay. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Hope you're doing well, inshallah. We're going to move on to chapter number eight uh, of our book, my first ever book discussion that I'm doing on YouTube. I hope it will be the first of many uh, of William Dalrymple's book, The Anarchy. You can see I've made loads and loads of notes. Um, and we're reaching towards the end of the book now. I think we have two more chapters or so before we finish the book. So that's the good news. Um, we're looking at the impeachment of Warren Hastings. Warren Hastings, an important figure that has played an important role in the book and also has played an important role in the history of India during the, uh, during the voyage of the East India Company. So at noon on the 13th of February, 1788, while Ghulam Qadir, who we talked about in the previous chapter, who was captured and mutilated, uh, he was preparing for his assault in Delhi against Shah Alam. Uh, in London, huge crowds were gathering outside Parliament to witness the members of the House of Lords process into Westminster Hall to impeach Warren Hastings out of all people. So um, this was probably one of the most uh, greatest spectacular events under the kingdom of uh, King George III and it was the nearest the British ever got to putting the company um, the company's India, Indian Empire on trial okay uh, and they had a great orator at the helm uh, the Anglo-Irish Whig statesman and political theorist Edmund Burke we mentioned him before and he was supported by uh, a very eloquent uh, person as well uh, Charles um, or uh, Charles James Fox. So these two people um, were after uh, trying to impeach Warren Hastings, who was really in charge of the company. So he was accused uh, of no less of a crime than the rape of India. And if you remember, his nemesis, Francis, who he had a duel with, um, is the one who has plotted all of this against um, Warren Hastings. Um, and... So there was a whole discussion um, between uh, as to what they should do with Warren Hastings. And the company rule, they argued, i.e. Edmund Burke and Fox, that uh, had, no had done nothing for India except to asset strip it. Every rupee of profit made by an Englishman is lost to India forever. Every other conqueror has left some monument uh, behind him. We were to be driven out of India were we were to be driven out of India to this day, nothing would remain to tell it had been possessed during the ingl inglorious period of our domination by anything better than an orangutan or a tiger. The company appears more like an army going to pillage the people under the pretense of commerce than anything else. Okay, And their business is more like a robbery than trade as well. Um, and so they said that they argued that the, the company should be held accountable before parliament as well. Um, now, the problem was uh, following Philip Francis, the ever vindictive Philip Francis, they'd been going after the wrong person. As we know, Warren Hastings was someone who was a somewhat sympathetic towards India, unlike, unlike Robert Clive. Okay. Um, so early in his career, Burke had defended Robert Clive. It's interesting, isn't it? Burke is now going after Warren Hastings uh, instead of going after Robert Clive against parliamentary inquiry. And so helped to exonerate someone who genuinely was a ruthless, unprincipled plunderer. Now that he directed his skills of oratory against Warren Hastings, a man who by virtue of his position was certainly the symbol of an entire system of mercantile oppression in India, but who had personally done much to begin the process of regulating and reforming the company, and who had probably done more than any other company official to rein in the worst excesses of its rule. Um, and so this impeachment was very, very personal. It was really about Philip Francis, who would um, wanted revenge on Warren Hastings as well. Um, so while Francis had given his resignation in, uh, uh, after the, after the suffering at the loss of Warren Hastings during the duel in 1870, um, he come back to London and he used his wealth, his Indian wealth, to buy a parliamentary seat and he began to plot the downward trajectory 
of Hastings. It was a very personal thing, but it was all played out in the arena of politics. This is nothing new, as we know, in politics. Politi politi politics, uh, people can get very, very personal uh, in their in their vendettas. Um, of course, Hastings wasn't exactly an angel. Um, the company under his rule did extract as much wealth as it could as well. So we have to be a little bit fair. And the book talks about some of the things that he did did he he did in the uh, while while he was in charge of the East India Company. Um, however, he was far by far the most responsible and sympathetic of all the all the officials who worked for the company in India. Um, the trial also exposed the sheer ignorance the British had about the subcontinent. Um, they'd been looting it, but they didn't they didn't even know. Uh, the country itself um, profitably for a long, long period of time. Indeed, some of the charges were almost comically confused. Um, the illiterate and pi piratical Rohila Afghan warlord Hafiz Rahmat Khan, for example, was conflated by birth with a 14th century mystical Persian love poet Hafiz, who had been dead in his grave for 400 years by the time of the impeachment. So they didn't even know what they were really talking about when they were going through this trial as well. Um, however, Few were surprised when after seven years, uh, Hastings was ultimately cleared. So he, he was cleared, um, but it really scarred him um, of his life. And it led to years of uh, depression and persecution for him as well. Um, whatever the trial achieved, he achieved one thing. There was one useful outcome that the trial actually succeeded in achieving. And it demonstrated the company's many misdeeds were answerable to parliament. And it helped publicize the corruption and violence of the East India Company. So it gave co the government greater oversight of the company, greater regulation and control over the company as well. So this was a process, as we know, which began in 1773 with the Regulating Act and, and had then been further enhanced uh, by Pitt's India Act of 1784, which made the company's political and military transactions subject to government supervision. It eventually culminated in the outright nationalization of the company 17 years later in 1858. We'll come to that in some other book or some other point later on. But by 1784, the writing for the company was already on the wall. So it, it became increasingly um, under government scrutiny as well. Amid all the spectacle of Hastings trial, um, a person came to replace him and they chose someone called General Lord Charles Cornwallis. Um, he, he, he was the one actually who surrendered uh, 13 American colonies of the British Empire to George Washington. So he, he wasn't exactly successful in America. Um, and we can talk about America at some other point. Um, and so he was now uh, tasked with taking over the East India Company. And he was the one who'd given over America, the 13 colonies of America to George Washington, who declared America or the States uh, as a free and independent nation. Um, his job was to make sure that they didn't lose India, just like they had lost America to George Washington. So he arrived in uh, Calcutta in 1786. Uh, Bengal at the time was flourishing. It was doing really, really well. Um, then the famine wrecked, you know, sort of dust bowl, which had greeted Hastings when he came there 14 years before him. Okay. Um, a lot of the success, ironically, was down to Hastings because of his reforms. Um, Calcutta was booming. It had a really high population. Um, and it was also known uh, as, as a city of palaces or the St. Petersburg of the East, uh, Calcutta. I've been to St. Petersburg when I went to Russia a few years ago. It's an absolutely beautiful city. So it was known as the St. Petersburg of the East, Calcutta was as well. Um, and it was, uh, it was one of the richest, largest, most elegant colonial city in the East, okay? Uh, so this was something that uh, Charles Cornwallis had inherited when he had made his way to India in 1786 as well. Um, the company was struggling, but now it was in a state of profitability. It was successful and it was making uh, lots of money as well. Um, company was able, the company state was able to keep building its army and apportion 3 million annually to military expenditure. So they were continuously investing in building a strong army. So when in 1791, for example, 
when war once again loomed with Tipu Sultan of Mysore, um, Cornwallis had now built an army which was able to now challenge him. Okay, Previously, they weren't able to do this, but now they had the manpower, weaponry, weaponry and militarized material to be able to challenge this threat. Okay, um, And they were confident. And they said if war uh, with Tupu was unavail unavoidable, they would now have a good opportunity of, of avenging their defeat at Polilo 12 years earlier. So the defeat that we talked about in the previous lecture. In 1783, um, as, as would have it, Heder Ali uh, of Mysore had died and uh, he had a tumour and Tipu basically moved in to consolidate the throne of his father. So Tipu Sultan had moved in. Um, he, was a very he was a very, very uh, commanding person. He was very brave, methodical, hardworking. He was very innovative. Um, he he was also not afraid to use European skills and knowledge to find ways to use them against his enemies. So he wasn't afraid to use whatever Europe was, had at the time in terms of his superior te technology and tactics to be used against them as well. Um, and he'd already done this. He'd already defeated the company, and not only at Polidor, but twice more since then. Uh, once he annihilated the British army under Colonel, uh, Colonel John Braithwaite, um, and then a year later, uh, before he became the king, if you like, he destroyed a third company column on the banks of the Coloron River. Okay, <clears throat> um, so he was quite <coughs> he was quite a thorn in the company's uh, ambitions. Um, he also began to import industrial technology through French engineers, and he began to experiment with using, for example, many things that he was doing was to use water power uh, to to drive his machinery. Um, he began to engage in building factories, his own ships as well. And his father uh, had advised him to win over the love of his subjects. So he went out of his way, for example, to win over and to protect the Hindus who were working in his dominion as well. So he was very, very active in what he was doing as well. So he was not just a good person. He was not very effective in just being a person who, who must stay craft. Um, he was also, in some ways, um, as the author describes him, a devout Muslim, uh, viewing himself as a champion of Islam, thoroughly embraced the syncretic culture of his time, and believed also strongly in the power of Hindu gods. So the book talks about how he worked really hard, not only as a Muslim, but also to win and to curry favours from his Hindu subjects as well. Of course, the British uh, portrayed him as savage and fanatical, um, but he was really an intellectual. I mean, he had a library, for example, uh, of 2,000 2, volumes of books in several languages, mainly on things like law, theology, secular sciences. And he also amassed um, scientific instruments like thermometers and barometers. So he wasn't just you know, a barbaric person. He was quite an intellectual person himself as well. However, as with any human being, he had flaws as well. Um, and which left him vulnerable to his enemies. Uh, for example, uh, he sometimes used unnecessary violence against his enemies after they'd been defeated. And this basically created uh, resentment against him. Okay. And so, uh, for example, he wasn't very good sometimes with diplomacy. For example, when Cornwallis reached Calcutta in September 1786, uh, Tipu was already at war with both the Maratha uh, and Peshwa and Nizam of Hyderabad. So these were the two people that had previously given him alliance, a triple alliance that we talked about in the previous chapter with his father, right? His father had a triple alliance with the Marathas and the Hyderabads as well. Um, so unlike Heder, who, who's, who had a triple alliance of coalition against the British, Tipu's aggressive attacks on his neighbors um, really made him upset. The Marathas and Hyderabads, that they, they began to more they began to incline towards Cornwallis, right, towards the company. Um, so a new triple alliance was formed. So they moved away from uh, Tipu Sultan to make an alliance, the Marathas and the Hyderabads, with the, um, with, the, with, the, with the East India Company against Tipu Sultan as well. And so as if he hadn't made any, uh, any enemy, uh, any enough enemies, uh, Tipu then decided to break off relations with Shah Alam, who was in Delhi. Uh, so becoming the first Indian ruler uh, to uh, to formally disown even a nominal sovereignty of to the Mughal emperor. And he even changed the Friday khutbah 
uh, should be read in his own name and not of the uh, Mughal emperor as well. And then in, in 1789, Tipu basically opened a new front. Um, he conquered North, Northern Malabar as far as, as far as Cochin. Now he decided to bring to obedience the Raja of Travancore to itself. The Raja had protected um, himself with remarkable fortifications known as the Travancore Lines. It was a very, very strong uh, fortification that he had. So when uh, at daybreak on the 29th of December 1789, uh, Tipu was able to um, break into this fort with his sepoys and he massacred the troops of Raja. Now he found himself um, at war with the Marathas, the Hyderabads, the people of Travancore, and again with his oldest and bitter enemy, the East India Company. So some of his choices weren't very politically savvy, and he basically gifted his, who would have been his friends, otherwise um, they were basically placed in the hands of the East India Company as well. Um, Cornwallis, with his army and his alliances, attempted to um, attack Tipu, um, they seized and assaulted one of the biggest, the second largest city, Bangalore, uh, where the Hyderabadis joined them as well. But um, they were, as they tried to push further ahead to sort of attack Tipu, um, bad weather hadn't worked in their favor as well. However, he 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 managed to make um, allies with other people like the Marathas. So, for example, as the army was retreating because of bad weather, um, they had only marched only half a day when. Uh, when near the town of Melkot, a troop of horses, 2,000 strong, appeared on the road in front of them. The alarm was raised and the first shots had been fired before it was realized that cavalry were not Tipus, but belonged to the Maratha allies. Okay, A much larger force came up, came up soon after and was found to be carrying ample supplies for both Cornwallis' bollocks and his men. So they were, they were really uh, given strength by these new alliances as well. So these three allied armies uh, marched back to Bangalore, right? And to sit at the reins and then uh, to prepare for a fresh attack uh, as soon as the monsoon subsided and the rivers had ebbed as well. Uh, eventually, um, Tipu had to, during the battle, had to negotiate for peace. Um, and he accepted, Cornwallis accepted Tipu's uh, negotiations, but he had to surrender half his kingdom, uh, pay an indemnity of what would have been 300 min 390 million pounds. Um, to release all the prison of his war that he had, and to also give two of his eldest sons as hostages um, in guarantee for full payment. So he had to hand over to his two of his sons, Cornwallis, and who would all then be returned once he'd made the payments as well. And they were given territories as well. And this was a really crushing blow to Tipu. We destroyed him as well. Um, so 1792, we're coming closer now to 1792. It was also a major turning point for the East India Company. Um, the company was often on the defense and always insecure, uh, but now the company was becoming more dominant. Um, it was a, up until now, it was a small Indian power, um, about 9.3% 9, 9 of India uh, in terms of its mass um, they had. Uh, but with great chunks of land it had seized from Tipu in the south, the company was now on its, well on its way to becoming the major territorial as well as military and economic power in India as well. Um, so the reforms uh, Cornwallis had initiated on his return to return to Cal on his return to Calcutta also allowed him to consolidate his position. So in America, for example, Britain had lost his colonies not to Native Americans, and this was really a racist policy that Cornwallis followed. Uh, in America, for example, they'd learned a lesson. In uh, the Britain, they'd lost a lot of their colonies uh, not to Native Americans as such but to the descendants of European settlers, okay? Uh, so Cornwallis then was determined not to make the same mistake he made in, in, in America to be made in India. And so he made sure that he, uh, he, he made sure, was determined to make sure that settled colonial class never emerged in India to undermine the British uh, as it had done uh, to his own, own humiliation in America. So he made sure that they didn't have their own colonial class in India. So, for example, uh, one in three British men in India were cohabit cohabiting with Indian women, and they were believed to be more than 11,000 Anglo-Indians in the three presidency towns. Now Cornwallis brought in a whole raft of embarrassingly racist legislation aimed at excluding the children of British men who had Indian wives or babies from employment in the company. 
right? So this was really, really racist. So racism was something that was, uh, as you read the book and, and, and other books as well, you see that racism was very, very dominant and ingrained in their policies as well. Um, so they also were successful because they were able to um, build regional alliances. The English were very good at building uh, relationships with regional power groups and, communi and, com and communities as well. And so they were able to maintain a delicate balance um, between merchants and mercenaries, Nawabs and Rajas, and above uh, all, they were able to also keep the bankers happy who they, need they needed money from to uh, continue with, with their exploitative practices as well. Uh, by 1790, and I'm just going to end here, by 1790, a certain Comte de Modave, for one, other, for one, had no doubt what lay in store for India. I am convinced, he says, that the English will establish themselves in the Mughal Empire only precariously and with much uncertainty, he wrote. And they will no doubt eventually, in due course of time, lose it as well. Then he talks about uh, they will control um, it for long enough to extract prodigious amounts of money from it, which will enable them to maintain the role they had arrogated to themselves of being the principal or rather the only power exclusive of all others among the trading nations of Europe. Okay, and he talks further about how they play a game of advancing without ever being seen to make any step forward. In brief, they assiduously, he's talking about English here, practice that old maxim followed by the Romans in their politics um, to everywhere to keep in place local rulers in order to use them as instruments to reduce the people to slavery. Very powerful indictment of their policies. And then he further continues in the same passage, I have no doubt at all that for some years the plan of invading Hindustan and taking over the trade of all the East Indies, Indies has been the object of their speculations and calculations, a profitable compensation for what they lost in America. If you also consider the power of the English Navy, the strength of their military establishments on the coast of India, you will realize that, that given the means already in their hands, they need make only a small effort to achieve this grand and magnificent project. And we'll talk about how the company uh, look really, really unassailable now. It's really, really a powerful force. Um, Tipu tried to reach out to his French friend, Napoleon Bonaparte, who was uh, busy preparing to take other parts of the Muslim world. And we'll talk about that maybe in the next chapter a little bit as well. I want to stop there. Hope you found it useful. So Warren Hastings has now left the picture. Tipu Sultan has been reduced in terms of his effectiveness and power. He's looking elsewhere for, for friendship. Uh, and the company is growing in strength now. Uh, at the same time, uh, while Parliament is trying to restrict them a little bit, and you'll see eventually the company is nationalized, but not before it can finish its job of looting India as much as possible. Hope you found it useful. We'll continue the final chapter or the final two chapters in the next video. Stay safe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.